So we are going to focus today to discuss a little bit with the tools that we have of an effective management and sustainable for crop management. We know that the year 2050, the global population will require 10 billion people. And that represents for agriculture a very big um, challenge. Agricultural workers are going to have to increase the food production 50 or 70 more production. And not only do they have to increment the production, but they have to do it in a sustainable way with methods that are more friendly to the, to the climate and to the environment. This brings us to the topic of today. That is the integrated pest management. And we're going to make an emphasis on the biological control. And I'm going to try to give you advice of ways in which you can implement a successful plan for integrated pest management. We're gonna talk about different tools that we have um, different accesses to the pesticides, to the predators. And this is the bank plans, material of being able to grow. These are tools that we're gonna be able to keep the population of pests down in the, in the crops and to also get ahead to the pest. We are gonna take an example, a study of mites, where I'm going to try to share with you inside all the tools that we have and how are we able to select? How do we choose what we want to do? How do we choose what we use to control mites? And last, we are going to focus a little to understand what is the importance to search the comp compatibility um, between the pesticides that are biorational and conventional when you want to use them together with natural, with nature. And then we're going to go to a conclusion and conclusion. And then I want to also give you an opportunity to start with these um, practices. So what is integrated pest management? This integrated pest management is utilizing different tools. We start with the crops that we're growing being healthy. We're going to try to choose materials that are that tolerate and are resistant, resistant to pest and disease. And we wanna continue using the control biological. We wanna use also, maybe sometimes using uh, chemical pesticides, but also maintaining the cultural um, controls that you can do, cropping, changing fruits, getting rid of fruits of plants that are affected. Like I said to you, we're gonna focus on the biological control. And for this, I wanna define what is biological control of, plant, of pests. So what is biological control? Is the use of beneficial organisms for the control of pests. And inside of those organisms, we have a big um, fan of options. We can talk of predators, um, we can talk about um, ladybugs, amphibians, for example, or we can talk about biopesticides with extracts of plants or products that are derived from plants that we call them here biopesticides, but we can call them biorationals. And some of those, we are used to using nematodes, mycoderms, we are used to using bacillus, BTK, astringent, etipel, or, or the use of bacteria, for example but they're not the only ones. We are gonna see a little bit, what do we have to do so we can take all these tools and then be able to put them in a program of integrated pest management that becomes um, successful, that we don't fail, that we can make a transition from a conventional way of management for a biological and a management that's biological, that is successful. The first thing that I wanna share is during this whole presentation, you're gonna see these friends right here. One that is Mark, that is, has a check mark and the other one, it has a red X. And what is green is yes, this is what we have to do so we can be successful. And what is in red and the red X here is gonna indicate, well, this is something that is better not to do if we wanna succeed in this program. I'm going to start by telling you that if you have a pressure of 
clients or consumers or of the world in general that are inciting us, inviting us that it's time to do this integrated pest management, this biological control to be more sustainable. But we're not going to be successful if we're not ready to start. And this to me is like start a diet, no matter how much your friends and our parents tell us, hey, you have to take a diet. If you're not mentally ready to do it, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to be successful. And what do I refer to? What things do we need to be ready is the next thing that I'm going to mention and that I'm going to continue in detail. We need to be committed. We need to have a, a plan and we got to commit and connect to that plan, follow it. The more that we could, straightforward. We also need to adjust the mindset. It is very different a control with pesticides versus a control with biological um, components. Normally, when we use pesticides, nor uh, pesticides that are normal, what we see at the beginning is an effect of like a shock. It is, um, yeah, you have less pests very quickly. We see that it goes down. And then what happens at the long period of time of the days over, or the weeks, what we begin to see is that those pesticides, it starts to degrade. And then each more, we're going to have less protection. This happens the total opposite when we start biological. When we use biology, what is going to happen is that that's, this biological pests are going to maybe take a little bit of a few days, weeks. It's going to take time to reduce the pest, but because they're going to eat that pest and they're going to reproduce on that crop, they are going to give us a control that is sustainable in the long period of time. And they're going to increase and they're going to increase that protection that they're going to give us over a long period of time. So it's going to be very necessary to practice patience, especially if you're thinking of transitioning from that conventional control to that biological control. For those productors that are using biorationals, okay, you're a little more used to it. But in general rule, you might be need to accept certain levels of action that are higher at the ones that we would accept that when we use pesticides. And then it's also really important to encourage that knowledge, not only of the pests, of the biological material, to understand, to recognize the plaques, the pests in all their states of development. And for that, you have to take workshops, um, go on websites, go on talks, go to school. And this is something that I highly recommend. So you can familiarize yourself with the tools and not only yourself, but you can transmit to your teams of your pest control and the people that you collaborate with in your crops so they can also understand what is happening and what is the controls that you're putting in and why are you putting them in. The other um, advice that I wanna give you is don't start with harsh residues in your crops, especially because we gotta to prepare to make this biological control with good ahead of time so we can actually reorganize the products that we're gonna use until the point in that we're going to start with this integrated pest management, biological management. I say this because if we have harsh and toxic residues, if we've been using organophosphorado, canamato, pure toys these are products that have residues eight weeks sometimes 12 weeks and if we have those residues in the crops and the soil when you go to release this biological control is that these insects they're going to die and sometimes it's worse to start with this toxic residues than what it is to start with a disease or pest higher level. This is important. We need the crops to be free of residues. So to start to avoid this, plan ahead um, with technical folks that can help you so you can plan this ahead of time with this biological control with three to four months ahead of time and check the list of side effects. There is a lot of companies that have that free available to you um, in the in the web page or in the different applications on the phones uh, for smartphones very well one of the things that we do have to do when we use biological control is to try to do things that prevent things 
And with this, I want to say that this is your biggest challenge that you have. It's the biggest challenge that you have that you're going to find. What do I mean with that? What do I mean with prevention? Is begin the the changes before the pest is in the crop. And this is like one of the things that is more difficult to accept because generally we say, okay, if I free these little pests in this crop and there's no pest for them, what is going to happen is that I'm gonna be throwing the money away. And then what I'm trying to say is when we help to plan this program of biological control, we are taking into consideration your previous experience, your previous experience that we had many years so basically we have a pest issue and we have this pest issue and they kind of come together like a magnet i think of a production of strawberries we're all thinking of the red mite you think okay it's how are you going to start a crop of strawberries with the red mite okay, a cultivating Poliseca and Mosca Blanca and white fly, it's impossible to have a crab that is totally clean of white moth. So thinking about these stories previously, what are the pests that we have for each crop? Is that we're going to organize a program that is we're going to anticipate the pest because it is very difficult that we can be active to 100% of the plants and probably the pest is present that perhaps we haven't seen it yet. So then if we're using yellow traps for the monitoring of the big one, maybe the plague, this pest is in a little egg and it's not a big one. It's not adult face yet. So to help you a little bit more so you can do a preventing program with the confidence that this biological controls are not gonna die. There is many tools that I'm going to talk about that I wanna share with you. No sirve porque es mucho más económico ser proactivo que ser curativo, ¿ok? Una vacuna es mucho más económica que terminar en, en una sala de emergencia. Eh, y una de las maneras que tenemos de ser proactivos es, por ejemplo, comenzar con inmersión de esquejes y plantines. That we have to be proactive is, here we are showing a picture, but we're going to we're gonna go deeper in a little bit. It's important to get ahead of this pest and maintain the biology that we're trying to get at so that we can use these materials like the sachet or use supplements or um, bank plants. We're going to start talking about different cuttings and seedlings. Why do we use this methodology? Well, we use it because normally our crops are coming from another greenhouse, from another producer, from another zone than ours. So normally we are importing seedlings that might be coming with a pest already. So to lower drastically the level, uh, the pop population level of the pest, we use this mix. So we generally, in a solution based on water, around 12 gallons of water, 50 liters of water, we put a little bit of trichoderm, around 20 grams, 10 to 20, 125 grams of, of Bulgaria and 50 million of the nematodes, Sterium nema filti. And we use the Esperello to be able to confront Pythium, Rosarium, all those types of diseases, but also to prevent some bacterial diseases like Gotritis. We use the Botanic Guard to lower the population of trips and white flies. And we use the nematodes to add more control of the white flies, of the trips, thrips, and to control the, the fungus gnats. And that's not the only recipe that exists because there's other institutions that have developed their own immersion programs. For example, Vineland Research Station in Canada, they use different biopesticides different mixtures. What I want to highlight here in red, in a red circle, are 
the treatments that reduced white fly population significantly in uh, poinsettia cuttings, but also that didn't cause toxicity. I want to make a note here. If you see here, in the first bar is about mineral oil at 0.25%. At this concentration is the toxicity. So if you see the 0.1%, it's a little bit more pests, but really it's more recommended because it doesn't cause phytotoxicity in the crop. So if you use formulation that are derived from petroleum, it's really likely that it'll cause phytotoxicity. And so use it a little bit before using it on your whole crop. Please make sure that you don't cause phytotoxicity everywhere. And this recipe that I talked about before, we used it eight years ago. You know, all products that are in, in powder and to date, we have never had a phytotoxicity problem. But if you want to control like a spider, maybe you want something that has mineral oils or, or soaps, it might be more effective than the other recipe I was talking about. So now we're going to go on to talk about breeding materials. What do I mean by this? It's the biological products that come in these little special bags called sachets and they have a little clip or a trellis we put it in the uh, crop or it could be loose what we do with it is we make little mounds we call them reproductive mounds why are they reproductive these, these materials why are they reproductive well i'm going to explain that now reproductive materials breeding materials are as as if we have a pyramid a food pyramid. So there's a carrier, in that case, um, mulch made of um, like this that you see right here, it's this little mulch made of wheat, and it's really good to act as food for an alternative prey. Be above all of this, we're going to place our predator. So at the tip of this pyramid, we're going to have our predator. It's going to feed on the alternate prey. It's going to feed on the food that's within the carrier, which is that mulch. Why do we want something like this? We need it because if we want to get ahead of this pest, that predator is going to have an alternative food within that mound or within the sachet bag. Of course, these materials are called breeding because they stimulate breeding and they are of slow release. So in the case of the sachets, they have a little hole, this little bag, the sachet. And once the predator starts growing, it's gonna get out of that bag. It's gonna flee that sachet and it's going to start walking through the crop. It's going to liberate itself through the crop. It's slow release because their reproductive capacity is of three to six weeks. It really depends on the particular predator that we're using. This is going to help us decrease releases. So instead of having to release these predators um, kind of spread around the crop, it's going to help us place those sachets or make those little reproductive mounds this week. And we won't need to do anything else because we know that we have protection for the next three to six weeks. It also helps us to create extra uh, bios in your crop. Why? Because we start with those sachets. Let's say that they have 250 individuals. Throughout those three to six weeks, we're going to be able to liberate more than a thousand individuals into the crops. So it helps us have this giant army of natural enemies, even if there is an absence of pest. It ensures an early establishment of bios. And that way, these natural enemies are going to be able to spread naturally throughout the whole crop before the pest can even arrive. 
when the pest arrived, the biological control is there to address it. And through that, we will prevent hotspots from being created. Good. So the next topic is element uh, food supplements. So I don't really want, let's say that I don't want to use these reproductive sachets, these breeding sachets. I prefer to free them in flight sporadically throughout the crops. What do I do if I don't have a pest? I want to maintain my biological controls in the crops. What can I do? Just like we eat a varied diet, or sometimes we even add vitamins, we can also do things like BioBest and other companies have created special supplements to provide a good food source to natural enemies. So what we want to find are robust natural enemies, and we want more of them. We want more of them before the pest even gets to the crop. What are these food supplements? Really, they are highly nutritional value food for bios that allow us to stimulate reproduction of bios directly on the crops where we are applying them. It, it permits us to maintain the bio populations and the, and the predator populations high while the pest isn't present. And it allows us to, it allows the bio, the natural enemy to complete its natural cycle more quickly. It helps us achieve high levels of biological controls. And it also, if we had to uh, apply a chemical that wasn't totally detrimental, but it could cause some mortality, mortality maybe 25%, 50%, uh, mortality of our natural enemies, then these supplements allow us to regenerate these natural enemies after we have had to apply a chemical. So it really helps us also establish these natural enemies at a low cost. Why do I say this? Because supplementing with these foods is actually more economical than duplicating, triplicating releases of natural um, enemies. It also allows us in those cases in which we are working with, let's say, fruit crops, citrix or apples, we find natural predators that come naturally. They just present themselves. We can't even find them commercially. But if we supplement them with these supplements, we can actually increase these natural predator populations. Good. So we're going to talk about two types of food supplements. And the uh, company I work for makes these. You could research more. There are other types of supplements. There's other companies that make them. But I'm going to focus here on what I know. We're going to talk about this special uh, pollen. It's called Nutrimite. And we're going to talk of these special eggs of Ephestia quenella. And we're going to talk about this in the next slides. Let's start with Nutrimite. Let's be really clear about what it is. It is nutrition for mites. Nutrimite. So this is the pollen that we're going to use for the mites. In this table, what you see in this purple square are the types of predatory mites that we have available in North America. Within all of these, there's two really that are Degenerans and Suriski that are the ones that respond the most to Nutrimite. We can increase the reproduction of Degenerans between 10 and 20 times if we use Nutrimites. The populations of Suriski can grow between two and five times with the use of it. I want to also note that these two mites, predatory mites, Andersoni and Limonicus, they don't really respond so much to Nutrimite. They just have one plus sign. 
these are products that are really expensive of applying so it, it makes even more sense to add neutramide when we are freeing them because if we want to augment like 20 30 percent of those mites of those predatory mites still the supplement the food supplement is going to be cheaper than increasing the doses of, of of freeing them and spreading them as i said this supplement helps increase breeding and reproduction and we will notice an increase in eggs that are laid generally these predatory mites put isolated eggs individually but when we give them the food supplement we see them in groups two three four the eggs are together so how are we going to apply these products well we're going to apply them directly i'm going to share this little video it's going to be a little loud with a leaf blower this person used a special applicator called nutria you put the nutria app directly attached to the to the equipment attachment which biobest creates what we see is a very thin film of this pollen this supplemental pollen is being spread we don't even see it on the leaf it's such a thin film so this is a little uh, image of how the applicator looks it's called nutriapp if you want, after the presentation, I can share what is the model of, of this um, that we use. The other supplement that I want to talk about is the Nutrimac and NutriCards. It used to be called Microloves. It is nutrition for mites and other products that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So when we're talking about these supplements, the Nutrimac comes loose, so these little eggs are loose. And in this case, with the cards, the eggs are going to be um, glued to this little card, and they're going to have this little special hook that we can use to hang. And these little eggs are special because they have a nutritional value for parrot bug. We have also for the chrysopa and other myriads and ladybugs. These eggs are um, irradiated and frozen, and the effect is going to be um, like the stored grains that we're going to call like a ground in, in flour like polilla. So to why do these eggs help us? They reduce the development time and the time that it takes for the adult to be able to reach his whole, the insect to be able to reach his whole production to also be able to have these eggs in the female predators. And they're also gonna be able to have the time that the beneficial insects live longer like adults. Why do we have that? Why does it serve us? Because those adults are gonna be in the crop for longer. They're gonna be predators for longer. They're gonna eat more prey. They're gonna lay more eggs. How do we use this product? We simply powder it on top of the crops or we hang the little cards in the little points where we know that we're gonna want, um, be like losing the predator, where we're gonna set them free. What are the advantages of using food supplements? The first advantage is that we're not gonna have to wait until the pest is present in the crop or that we have flowers that then the beneficial insects can eat from the flowers of the pollen. We can do these applications right away in vegetable state, vegetative stage. We can begin to free our biologicals and establish our biological controls, or that we wanna remove flowers sometimes because, I don't know, because we're producing peppers in the first flowers, we remove them so the plants can be bigger in their vegetable stage. So if we don't have that food supplement because we remove the flower and the predator comes a pollen, well, when you take out the flower, you don't have that food for them. So then they're, this, these are gonna help us very much. It's very easy to use because you don't have to put another crop. We don't have to like irrigate. We don't have to give food to another crop 
or we can also store them in the freezer so we can purchase them ahead of time for many months. In the case of Nutriment and the pollen, it can last up to years if you have it in the freezer. And like I said before, it's a very economic way to increment the number of predators. It has a very high um, benefit. Very good. What are the other techniques, the other technique or tool that I want to share with you? Let's say that the um, reproductive materials didn't work. Then the other, um, the food um, that we were just talking about is not for you. Then we can use banker plants. The banker plants are plants that are different from the crop that can help us reproduce, to host, to breed, to feast, to have a home for the sustained um, beneficials, for those beneficial insects. And it could be plants of the ones that I'm gonna to talk to you about that are specific for certain predators, or we can plant um, smartly. We can use plants that attract these beneficials from nature. So maybe you have seen a lot of universities started to do development of list where they say, hey, this plant is great to bring this organ. This plant is good to try to bring in chrysophiums. And we call um, a bug garden, an insect garden for also for pollinators. There is whole corporations that sell seed that is like a seed for beneficial for attracting for biological control. So for example, there's a lot of Johnny seeds. They have a mix, a special mix with cosmos, with sunflowers, alfalfa, um, a lot of plants that are gonna attract a lot of these plants for these biological controls that we're gonna bring in from nature. So it's very good that if you're going to plant this um, in the contour, where you're going to plant, you can plant this like islands in the heads of the lines or in between the crops or in between lines or at the head of the lines. So you can attract this biological controls. Very good. I'm going to talk about two plants of this banker plants. The first one, it's this plant that is gonna control aphids. This plant is a barley plant that I showed right here that is inoculated with grain aphid. The scientific name is Ropalacisum pari. And this type of aphid of the cereals is an aphid that only can develop and feed from plants that are from a narrow plant, so monocots. So these aphids of the cereals, this grain aphid, cannot um, attack a crop of a broadleaf. So if we have a crop of peppers or a crop of tomatoes or a rose crop or another crop, these aphids are not gonna affect that crop, but they're going to act as a host or prey for our parasitoids or the predators that we're going to release and what we're able what we're going to be able to do is that our natural enemies are going to get bigger and develop between inside this green aphid and when the aphid pests come to our crop for example a lungon verde or a pest for the potato or a pest for the um, tomato these aphids are going to go and attack them. So there is another plant that is called sweet alyssum. This is a plant that is able to attract at the adults of the surfer fly and larva. This is an insect that is so strongly that is not available in North America commercially, but combining the sweet alyssum, but combining with the green aphid, we can actually attract them and we can attract the adults of the surfeit fly and we can have a better control of aphids in the crops that we're cultivating. Um, if we put together the Elysium and the green aphid also brings in different um, biological control like the ones we see below. The next one that we're gonna talk about is the banker plant to reproduce the predator Oreos, that is the chinchi pirata. The, the Oreos is our best control of trips. This is the, the best control that we have for trips. The plant that we use is an ornamental pepper, purple flash, and 
we are going to free to release the Oreos and Sodios. Um, this is the Oreos in different stages, adult at the bottom, nymphs in two different stages, and the eggs at the top. And what these plants of peppers um, do is that they give us flowers, they give us um, oval oviposition sites and pollen. And then we're also gonna give it the supplement, um, Ephestia, to be able to reproduce these Oreos even faster. This is one of the things that is a disadvantage is that this pepper has is that it takes um, a lot of time to produce it. You have to plant it in October to then be able to have plants ready in October to be able to um, release the Oreos in February or March. So that means you're gonna have to have a greenhouse that is heated to do this production. And that is sometimes not possible. In other countries like Costa Rica, I have used uh, portulaca plants. And the reason why we have used portulaca plants is because the ornamental pepper have a pest that is the picudo of, pe of pepper. So we couldn't use the purple flash. So we had to change the, the banker plant and we had a really good luck with portulaca. So it's faster. And if we put this supplemental, this food element, even if we don't have flowers, the Oreos is gonna reproduce because this is a very succulent plant and the Oreos can put in the eggs, inside the plant, inside of the stalks of the portulaca. Why does this work, this whole idea of inserting a banker plant? Well, the same that we were saying earlier for the food supplements, it, we're gonna maintain a high and a constant number of natural um, enemies, parasites and predators. We're gonna attract beneficials from nature and this additional to the banker plan that we can't achieve that with the supplemental food, um, it allows us to effect that the beneficials complete their cycle of life and persist in our spaces, in our countrysides, even in high rotation crops. For example, if we're producing lettuce, that is a crop that is very quickly, that has a very short cycle, or for example, ornamental, that eight or 10 weeks they're done in the greenhouse. If we have banker plants, no matter what, how much we sell those plants or the crop that we're cultivating, the plants, the banker plants are gonna keep the biologicals in there in our greenhouse or in the land. But the biologicals who are in the crop that I'm gonna sell, they're gonna leave with that crop that I sold. And also they are useful to us because they help us preserve the beneficials on the banker plants in case that we have to do an application of chemical treatment. In this case, we can cover the banker plants or in another case that they are in planters, we can move them away from the crop and then do the application of the spraying. And in that way we can preserve our beneficials that are in there. I want to tell you that even all these benefits, there is a disadvantage that is very big of the banker plants, is that you have to basically lead with another crop, with another crop that perhaps you have to irrigate in a different way, you have to fertilize in a different way, and a crop in which on top of um, bring in other types of pests that could affect the crop that we're growing. One example in the case of the ornamental peppers is that we could have had an incursion of aphids or uh, mites or powdery mildew in those plants, in those banker plants. So if you're starting with the biological control, this adds complexity to the system. So I just recommend it for those people that are already habituated and familiar with this, that for the people who are already familiar to it and wanna go one step farther and wanna have a more economical and ecological control. But at first, putting in those banker plans can, can make the system more complex, more complicated. So another one of the things that I wanna talk about is that you have to do, of course, to have a success in this integrated pest management is to do monitoring. Monitoring visually with traps. You have to mark where you find pests. Um, have different colors. We use these tapes, these plastic tapes or these colored clips, and we assign a color to each pest. 
with a marker, permanent marker, you can add the day that you found the pest. And then in that way, you can monitor how well these biological controls are working. So let's say I find the pest and I do a release of predators and two weeks later, and I know, okay, yes, this is how long ago I found this pest. And I can see if in these two weeks, am I winning or do I need to incorporate more beneficial? Do I have to increment the doses? And then when you do visual monitoring, you're going to see obvious things that are going to call out attention, that we're going to be able to flip the page and look, what do I have? Do I have larva? Do I have eggs? But look for the obvious signals like holes, other insects moving, spattering in the leaves, um, coloring changing in the petals, um, little skin molds in the leaves, and anything else. Why is it important to do this monitoring? Because we really want to um, identify the pest and the predator. So here I have a picture that I want to share with you. We're going to liver Soriski in their adult age or Persimiles in their adult. But these little pests that I'm releasing in one moment are going to die. So we got to see that they're reproducing. So it's very good to be able to understand the stage of the egg. This is the egg of the Soriski. And we see it up here to the right. This is the egg of the pest of the acaro, the red spider mite. And we also see the egg of the persimilis egg. So if we're flipping the leaf and we see a colony of acaros, but in the middle of that colony, we also see this other egg that it's more like an ovule that is bigger. We know that we're not alone. We know that we need to do an application. The biological is reproducing, is there. Okay, so it's not only important to monitor for identifying the pest and the natural enemy, it is also ideal because some beneficial insects only attack the, the plague in a certain um, reproduction stage of that pest. So we got to make sure that this is present in the crop so that this biological control can do something of efficiency, efficacy. It is also helps us in being able to figure out when is the good timing of biocontrol releases, treatments, or chemical treatments, and to also assess the treatment of the um, performance. Super important too is to gather data, to put it in an Excel sheet, and to put it as a, as a chart so that we can see the population level in a graphic, uh, so that we can see you know, from week to week, what has happened. If you don't want to do this, there are software. Bionex, it, it, BioBest is not the only company, but uh, we do have crop scanner. Um, it's not free. It is for, it, you have to pay, but you can use your phone. You can use a tablet to collect data out in the field. This gets synchronized, it goes to the cloud, and then it downloads into your computers at the office. When you're at the office, you can get visuals like what I'm going to show here. You can use, um, for example, a field or a greenhouse and through GPS, the application, the app is going to detect where it is. You put your observation in there and depending on the level of a pest that you have, it's going to make these heat maps for us. We're going to see with codes and colors if the pest is present in high levels or low levels. So in red, we have the hot spot. So it's really easy to see for this pest where I'm going to have to release these beneficiary insects. And if we find a specific observation. We see on this table how much we have of this pest in the last five weeks. So we're going to be able to see a visualization if this pest has gone from yellow to green or from green to red. So visually, quickly, in a second, I can understand what it is that's happening with pests in this specific place in that field or that greenhouse. The other thing that Crop Scanner allows for is to monitor. What does the monitoring do? We see the route of the monitoring. We realize that the monitor doesn't monitor the end of this greenhouse. It's forgetting to get to the end of this greenhouse, or it's not monitoring close to the central um, hallway. So we know that pests 
sometimes happen from the outside in to a field. Same with the greenhouse, there's more heat closer to the walls or closer to a concrete um, hallway. So, so that's why our monitors, our, our scouters are important and we can also use graphics, we can filter. What kind of pests do I wanna see? What kind of graph do I wanna see about it? And the other thing that we not only have to do monitoring with traps, but we don't have to, we can't forget about massive monitoring. This doesn't work because let's say that for every 100 um, female gnats that get caught in this, um, this glue, I'm going to prevent them to reproduce. And if I wouldn't have catched them in two generations, they would have generated one point 125 million eggs so imagine in two generations throughout a month and a half if i wouldn't have caught these hundred females i would have had in my crops more than a million pests so i'm considering that each female is putting laying 150 eggs and that 50 percent of those eggs are going to be female 50 percent are going to be males so imagine how good it is to remove a pest through these massive traps. It's very good. So please handle these products, these biological products properly. They all have labels that say how you should handle them, or you might receive the product in cold. So don't expose it to the heat. If you have to go to a break, if you're going to eat your lunch, please cover it bring that box with you to the office put it in the shade don't expose it to the sun keep these bottles horizontally what this achieves is a better distribution of the bios throughout this bottle if we put it vertically then the bios are going to go where there is air up top so they're all going to accumulate up at the top but if you put it that bottle horizontally, you're going to have a better distribution of bios along this bottle. And it will make it easier to mix the bio in the carrier before liberating it, spreading it, freeing it. The other thing that you have to pay attention to is if this product isn't going to be used immediately, if you're going to store that product to liberate it the next morning, if we're going to store it, check the icon on the label it looks like a thermometer and it indicates the temperature of storage so for so this product is like up to eight eight um celsius so that means it needs to be in the fridge so now we're gonna start our case study we are running out of time so this case study that I'm sharing is mite control. We have lots of tools to control mites and um, red ants. So these four that are on the left side of this line are our specific controls for mite control. These others, Kukumari, Soriski, they're controls that we can use in the strawberry, for example, to control white flies, etc. But but for their dessert, they can eat mites. So these are some of the tools that we have. How do we free them? How do they come to us? They come in little bottles, like I showed in a carrier, in mulch. And you can put them either manually with leaf blowers, loose in little boxes that will spread throughout the crops. Or we can use drones for crops that are outdoors. If you use crops, you can see this video. Applying this through drones is a super quick application. In some seconds, you do a whole acre. And the person that's doing this application, at the end of applying it, can see perfectly in this visual how much they covered the route that they covered in this picture, we can see what the drone um, did, and it's it's an application, an app. 
there's other mic controls out there, some that fly, Felitiela, Tetrus, and also other tools that we can count on, like Birational, this mineral oil, products based on neem, MET52, sulfur, that can be put as steam, or you can uh, spray as a dust. And also, it, so we have so many tools that we can use to control mites. The question is, how do I decide what product I should use? How do I use it? And I have so many things to choose from. Well, we have several ways of choosing. For example, we can look what, at what type of mite is present. Do I have one type of mite or several types of mites? And so I can select a predator that is very specific or more general. What are the environmental conditions I'm going to have in this crop? What is the level of, of pest? Do I need something that eats a little bit or that eats a lot? Does the crop have pollen or not? Because some of these predators can feed on pollen, even if the pest is at low levels. Are any, uh, there are some controls that aren't so affected by chemicals. So like if I'm going to use chemicals, what is the formulation? Do I, and how do I apply it? Do I, am I going to use it through sachet bags or spray it? And then price, if I can choose uh, between three things, I can choose the cheapest one. Let's say that I want to choose depending on the pest that is present, but what type of mite is present here in this line, we see the four types of control for mites that are most common and how we might choose them. If we have tetranithus, like two-spotted spider mite or, or carmite mite, I think that that's what it's called in Spanish, carmin mite, but we can use something very specific like persimis. It's only gonna eat that mite, but if this crop is also susceptible to white um, broad mite, cyclamen mite, Lewis mite, then I can use Californicus. Throughout this line, I start placing in this bolded letter, what is the type of mite that it uh, addresses? So I go from the most specific to the most general. Andersoni has the capacity to eat everything that the other ones eat plus russet mite and gal mite, right? So let's say that what I have in my crops is only two spotted spider mite. I can actually use any of the four. How do I define, how do I decide which one I use if I can use the four? I'm gonna then look at the environmental conditions. If this crop is at low temperatures, then I'm gonna choose phalasis. But note that Andersoni also has a very wide range of temperatures. It can work very well in very cold temperatures or very high temperatures. If we're gonna have moderate temperatures and levels of humidity, I can use persimilis. If I know that my crop is gonna be very dry, then I'm gonna use Californicus. This is another way to choose. And now, I'm going to summarize. OK, so the level of pest pressure is important. If I'm going to do a very preventative control, then I can choose those mites that have the capacity to survive in my crop in the absence of pests, or one that I can supplement using food supplements, or that come formulated in breeding materials. So when the pest is already present, let's say the two spotted spider mite, if that's the, the pest that's present, when I detect it, when I start to see it, even if it's still really small, I can use Phytocellulus persimilis, it's super specific. If it doesn't have food, it will die. Or I can put the other predators that are eat a lot of other things, or I can apply a biopesticide that is focused or that is general if I can no longer control this pest. Or I could do a general liberation freeing of a miticide. So if I have to use 
that pesticide application, even if it's a biopesticide or if it's a conventional pesticide, I'm going to need to check the list of secondary effects, of side effects. And I want to pause here because when we use biopesticides, if these are of biological origin and they are considered to be a biological control of pests, it doesn't mean that these biopesticides are, aren't going to be harmful for the natural predators. So that's why I give you these tips, what to look at in the biopesticide. If the active ingredient is broad spectrum, like an evergreen, a trigali, then the chances are really high that that bioinsecticide is also going to take with it our natural uh, predators. But if this biopesticide is super selective, like Centarium biped, uh, Cetus tuorentensis, which we use for caterpillars or paradiferous, well, then we are taking less risk if we choose that because it's selective. It's probably more ben benevolent with our beneficiary insects. Also formulation, if it's in powder, it's gonna be more beneficial than if it's used, if it uses oils based on petroleum. That's what happens in EC products. Also the mode of action. If they are products that kill by suffocating, what it means is that it will cover the pores through which the insect breathes. So if the mode of action is suffocation, the most likely thing that happens is that it will kill our biological controls. So the benefits of biopesticide is that they are low residuals. So even if I take the predators, you know, next week, I can liberate them again. The other good thing is that most, if not all biopesticides act through contact. So it's really hard to ensure 100% contact because there's always a chance that the pests can escape, but also the beneficiary in insects escape. So how can we check what is gonna happen? How to achieve compatibility? Go to the list of side effects. You can go to our website, www.biobestgroup.com. And under our um, suggestions, you're gonna see the side effects list. We're not the only company doing this. There's numerous companies, but always be the most conservative possible. If Biobest says that it kills 30 to 50% and the other one says 25%, choose 50%, have that in your mind. It's better to, to uh, it, it's better to be overly concept, concept, conservative. You are going to be able to select, make a PDF, select which slide you want to have, and to figure out which are the biological controls you're trying to use. And what this graph is going to give you is with a color coordination from the green of the softest to the red, the most toxic, what is the effect in nymphs or adults of the different adults or um, nymphs, and what is the persistency of that product? It also exists an application that is free that you can download on the Apple Store or the Play Store for Samsung, where you can see the same guide of the secondary effects in your own smartphones. Okay, so this is going to finish the talk and I'm gonna give you a question and hopefully that the answer is positive. Do you think that all the, all the agricultural workers, any producer can use this biological control? I hope that in the chat you can say, yes, there is a tool of all the tools that we spoke about that some of you can start to incorporate in your programs to be able to do a successful biological control. And like a conclusion, I wanna make a little summary here. Start the most simple way. Start with a part of your crop. Um, start with a little bit of acreage. If you have a lot of greenhouses, start with one greenhouse or two greenhouses. 
just pick some of the crops that have the least amount of crops so you can get familiarized at the beginning so you can be comfortable with these different applications. Um, choose methods that are um, similar to your routines. Start with practices that are the most um, sanitary, that methods that you can tolerate easily. Um, check that there's no harsh chemical residues. Monitor. Use all the tools that we talked about today so you can sustain and so you can um, be able to release your biological control, please compromise to the plan and listen to recommendations of your advisors. Thank you so much for all your attention, for your time. And now we're open to any questions if you have any. And Veronica, you covered a huge amount of material in a very short amount of time. So, so thank you for that. Um, there are no questions in the chat box right now, but if anyone has a question for Veronica, feel free to go ahead and, and write that question into the chat. Um, and while we wait to see if there are any questions from participants, Veronica, I, I, I know a lot of people um, on the call and who will watch this recording um, are interested in, in using uh, biological control and feel maybe a little intimidated about where to start. And, and you, know, you, you really did a great job covering all the complexity and considerations of a biocontrol program. Um, do you, does BioBest have a Northeast uh, technical representative that, that you could share the contact information uh, for folks listening? Yes, yes, uh, we do have uh, one of our reps. Her name is Agreen Davari. Um, I can share with you maybe in the chat her uh, email address. So it will be her name, agreen.davari at biobestgroup.com. Um, as you may have heard, Biobest has um, purchased plant products uh, recently. And uh, in June, we're gonna finish our integration. There will be more colleagues that are also in that region. Um, I think Andrew I is also active in the region. We also have another specialist uh, in different crops. His name is um, Elwood Roberts. So the three of them will most likely be taken uh, care of the Northeast. And sometimes from time to time, I also go to the area. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna write her name over here. I can't remember um, her phone number, but I think if you contact a green, that was a great question. Thank you so much, uh, Ethan. I, I just put it on the chat. Great, thank you for sharing that information. I'm sure people will be reaching out. Um, no problem. Still don't see any other questions. So maybe I'll ask one quick one and then we can wrap up, which is I, I know from working with many growers in winter high tunnel production in the Northeast who are growing specialty cold hardy greens, especially spinach, sometimes salanova salad mixes, that it's very common to have an issue with multiple aphid species in those cold tunnels. Um, and, and I appreciate the slide that you shared with some of the temperature ranges for some of the predators for, for mites, but do you have any recommendations um, just off the top of your head for those cold environments that, that growers encounter aphids in? Yes, absolutely. So um, we do have um, a, a battery of four different uh, parasitoids, actually parasitoids for aphids. Um, and one of them is called Aphidius matricariae. Um, I'm sorry, I switched to English. Um, disculpen, no, no me di cuenta que, que, que cambia el inglés. I'm sorry that I switched to English. So we have this parasitoids that is more used to the climate that is a little bit colder. And this is Aphidius matricarian. Yes, and, and it's a little versatile. It can have um, on small aphids or bigger ones like Foxlove aphid or the aphid of Melocotton aphid or green beach aphid. And after those controls as predators, I would be inclined to use Chrysopidos, the lace wing, uh, chrysopas, in the state of the egg or the adult. One of the things that we're going to observe when we do this control of aphids is that it's not that the 
if we liberate the Kolemani, it's not that they're going to die, it's that it's going to take a long time in that it manifests. So we're going to keep seeing and our aphids in the crop until the temperature raises up a little, and then we see everything mummified. So I would start with Fides Maticari and Lacewing. Thank you. switching between languages I asked you in English I know that's the natural inclination to respond in English so so thank you for that sorry for that yeah <laughs> um, there are a couple of questions coming into the chat now um, so the first is if I find an exotic pest um, what would be the steps to follow if I want to carry out a biological control um, and so I think that's from Eduardo and Eduardo Maybe if you could provide a little bit more information, that might be helpful about what kind of exotic pests we're looking at. Um, but Veronica, would, would you like to respond yeah. to that? Yes, yeah, yes, I, I, I do have uh, some advice actually. So first of all, it's really important to identify the pest. If the pest is an exotic pest, then it, you may be in trouble in a way that, okay, you need to really double check uh, what's the status of that pest in your country, right? Um, if the pest is not a quarantinable pest, of course, we can look for uh, a predatory parasitoid um, that could control. Um, normally, if the pest is exotic and the biocontrols that we have um, are not good for it and we need to bring them from the areas where the pest is from, then the government will be, will be involved in that, will be kind of one of the examples of classical biological control, okay? And so we won't be able to do that. You will have to go to extension agents like uh, Ethan through universities uh, and through the USDA maybe to gain access to those predators or parasitoids. Now, if with our controllers, um, okay, we have some of them you have seen are quite generalistic, right? So Oreos, for instance, Chrysopa, for instance, they can eat multiple pests. Well, we can try releases with those ones to try to tackle that exotic pest. But definitivamente, um, yeah, we, we will need to know what we're dealing with, okay? We need to identify the pest first and you have to be cautious. Sometimes, So it's good if you investigate a little bit, if you talk to your technical advisor and try to figure that out, because once you send your pest to, uh, you know, uh, universities or, or, or extensions, if the pest is uh, non-native, they will have to report it. So, yeah, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> we don't want to get too in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Veronica, and it's, it's no very problem. true. Um, <laughs> We, we have one more question and then we'll we'll wrap up in the interest of time. Um, Tony has a question I think that that kind of builds on 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 what you were just discussing maybe which is with some of these um, predatory insects that can be released that have a, a wider range of insects that maybe they consume. Um, are there any known occurrences of having these bio pest treatments not working the way they should and causing problems perhaps maybe going after other beneficial insects. I think I can imagine Tony is a beekeeper who has been on a lot of these and maybe might be thinking about Yes, that. and it's a great question. Thank you, Tony, for asking this. So that's what we call intra-guild predation, right? So normally predators that are quite generalistic, um, like Andersoni, as I showed, or, or even the lace wings or Oreos, uh, if there's nothing else around for them, they may end up eating some of your other bios. Okay, sure, it, it, is, it is possible, that there is a possibility, but normally that uh, consumption of the others is kind of gradual as well, okay? Okay, they do it just to survive a little bit, to maintain uh, and, and yeah, and to pass their genes onto their offspring. Um, but in all honesty, sometimes you have like a, a, a location of the, of the predators kind of stratified in the crop. So for example, if I put Californicus and Phyto uh, persimilis, you have seen, you may see the Phyto, the persimilis like a little bit lower in the canopy, and you will see the Californicus like taller in the canopy because it's drier, it's, it's hotter. Uh, so como que 
Yeah, como que ellos eh, pueden encontrar su propio... So it is difficult to find their niche as inside the crop, the, the cult, what you're cultivating. So yeah, if this relationship is maintaining the time, well, we may not have anything to sustain them, to feed them. Yeah, there might be some of them that might feed, um, eat the predators. But in general, the, the plague is going to come and each is going to have to eat the pest that has a preference. And they're going to find themselves in the plant that they're more comfortable with and the, the, where the conditions of climate are better for them. In the judicious, you see it faster. But when you think of biological control, these insects exist in nature. If you go to a forest, everything is interacting. Everything, there's generalists, specialists, and each of them is going to try to find their best niche to be able to find themselves in. questions that we have today. Veronica, I want to thank you again so much for your presentation and all the time that you invested in this. It was it was really valuable. And I'm, I'm sure some of us will be reaching back out with, with follow-up questions. Um, yeah, thank you. Feel free. OK, so my email and my phone number is in there. Just feel free to text me, to email me. That's fine. Yeah, great questions great. later. Yeah. Perfect. Thank okay. you. No, my pleasure. And thank you. Thank you, ladies, for the translation. Uh, Adri and Lala, thanks so much. And thank you, Ethan, for, for the invitation. Uh, it was a pleasure. It's fun to do this. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And for everyone else who's still listening, um, I will be sending out a follow up email in the next couple of weeks. Um, for those of you who are in Eastern New York, there will be opportunities to continue engaging with those of us who have been part of the Spray Safe, Spray Well team um, with some on farm direct technical support. Um, so please be on the lookout for that, or you can reach out to me as well. You should all have my email address by now. Um, I do also want to echo Veronica's um, appreciation for all of the amazing support we've gotten from both Lala and Adriana throughout the entire workshop series. You've been wonderful, um, great to work with. So thank you so much for all of your support.